paradigm shift. An educational comedy. It's not a cause. Not a movement. It's not a social group you can slap a label on. It's, it's an, an idea. idea. It's an intention. It's an intuition. A mindset in which reality can be explored. It's a genuine expression. A certain Critical thinking and imagination. To look inward upon ourselves. To better understand the external world around us. And yes, true egos are bound to be bruised. With our silly, zany, politically incorrect. Your style of going about things. Real, Real and raw honesty. Which invites you to be to the, the fullest. fullest. See, and I know this is true, and there's nothing wrong with taking the time that it needs because there's no other way around it. But sometimes, and obviously this doesn't stop me, but a lot of the times I would rather not show you the processes or show you some of like the old, old paradigm shit that I still have in my system. I understand. There's a part of you that that feels like it's... it's there, there, there's a part of you that just feels freaking embarrassed about it. I mean, God, I'm not exactly perfectly fucking shifted either. I mean, all the stuff that, that I've shared with you and Katarina and Rochelle, there's still a part of me that's freaking, like, embarrassed and nervous and, and so on and, and so forth. I'm not, you know, master fucking paradigm shifter, figured it all the fuck out, cleared everything the fuck out, God had guru over here. I mean, fuck. You know, we all help each other. So, yeah, I get it. I understand what it feels like to, to not want, to like, to want to show your processes, but at the same time to not. Because there's that part of you that's just like, oh, I'm feeling a bit embarrassed about that. I don't want to, eh, you know. And part of me knows how stupid it is, so then when I start to talk about how stupid it is, it makes me feel a little stupid. Not always, though. Yeah. And also, I just, I feel like I pride myself on how fast I paradigm shift, so when I'm, it's taken me a while to clear through shit, it's like, this is really competitive and it makes no sense. <coughs> it is old paradigm, but I want to go way faster than you and Katarina <laughs> did. Well, here's the irony. You actually are. It's just when you're in that mode, you don't realize how fast you're going. Remember my train analogy? You're on the train, and it's traveling at, at, at 50 miles an hour. <clears throat> and your inertia inside the train is matched with the train. So it's, it feels like you're standing still. You know, we've all experienced this if we've been on a train. Um, and then imagine you're not sitting down, you're not holding on to anything. And all of a sudden, the train jumps from 50 miles an hour to 80 miles an hour. That train is obviously going 30 miles an hour faster, right? But because your inertia is not exactly matched to the trains in a smooth enough way that you are adapting to the acceleration along with that train, you're getting thrown around in that cabin, bumping your head on shit, tripping and falling, feeling victimized, going, oh, woe is me. And that feels like failure. You know what I mean? Yeah. But that doesn't change the fact that you went up 30 miles an hour. But that sudden burst of speed, if that burst happens and you're not holding on to anything or sitting down, your ass is going to get thrown around the inside of that train. Like, smack your head into shit and whatever, you know? You're going to hit the floor, among other things. Mm -hmm. So those are the moments that you feel stupid. Those are the moments that you feel like you're failing. And the irony is, is that you're not. You are going faster than me. You are going faster than Katarina. But when you're getting thrown around inside the fucking train, it sure don't feel like it. It just feels like you're getting thrown the fuck around. You're not thinking, oh, this is happening because there is a sudden burst of inertia. You know what I mean? Your brain isn't there because all of a sudden, <coughs> your mind is in what the fuck mode. All you're focused on is that you're getting thrown around the inside of the train and you don't like it very much. <laughs> so it feels like failure. When ironically, it's not. You're getting thrown around because you just jumped 30 miles an hour faster. It's just you sped up so quickly you didn't have time to adapt. And so you got thrown around. Yeah, that's accurate. <laughs> but it's all good. You're getting there. Let it be what it is. Like when a baby's learning to walk, you know. It takes what it takes. But the baby inevitably learns to walk, right? Mm -hmm. 
And I'll give you another analogy. It's like jumping off of the pier. Only when you're still on the pier do you have the option of walking away from the pier and not jump, not jumping. But once you're jumped off that pier, you're going to hit the water. There's no taking it back. Well, once you started shifting and you have, there's no taking it back. Gravity takes its course. You can make it as easier or harder on yourself as you want, but there's no taking it back. And the reason is, is because you can't unknow something. You know what I mean? Try to unknow the fact that the Earth is round and there's a star in the center of the solar system. Try to unknow that. Good fucking luck. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yes. And you've integrated quite a lot when it comes to paradigm shifting. You can't unknow that. You've got neural networks for that. Just like you've got neural networks that say, there's a star in the center of our solar system, the grass is green, the sky is blue, and the earth is round. There's no way in hell you can unknow that. You've jumped off that pier, you've hit the water. There is no way of taking it back. You know what I mean? You can only try and reprogram it with something else. But with something like that, it's near impossible. I mean, I don't know of anything that could convince anybody that there isn't a star in the center of our solar system. You look up in the sky during the day, there's this big hot ball of fucking light right there. You know, there's no getting around it. It's literally in your face. (laughs) So does that make sense? Yeah. So when it comes to the paradigm shifting stuff, you jumped off the pier. You're in the air. You're going to hit the water. There's no taking it back. So you don't have to worry about failing with it or something. It's like worrying about, it's like jumping off the pier and thinking, oh, am I going to fail to hit the water? <laughs> no. But now imagine if you could slow down the time it takes for that jump instead of several seconds. Imagine if you could slow that down to two or three or four years. Oh, my gosh. You know what I'm oh saying? My God. Oh my God, am I ever going to hit the water? Or is something going to like come and grab me and take me in a different direction? And no, it's not. Because <laughs> when you speed it up into the three or four seconds and you take the physics into account, you understand. The physics is what it is. After you jump off the pier, there is no taking it back. You're going to hit the water. There is no taking it back. That's part of why your dad is so frustrated. No matter how much he tries to do his domineering shit, there's no way he can make you unlearn what you've learned. And all of his control tactics were based on who you used to be, not who you are, and not who you're becoming. Yeah. he He can't make you take it back. He can't make you unlearn what you've learned. Well, in a sense, we, we, we unlearn and relearn, we reprogram, but reprogram isn't unknowing. There's a difference between reprogramming and unknowing. Like, when you reprogram your mind, you still know that before it was programmed to what it was. You know the processes that you took to shift, and then the end result of that when you get there. You can't unknow any of that. You can't unknow how you were before then. You can't unknow what you did in the meantime, and you can't unknow the end result. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So even with unlearning and relearning, unlearning is not unknowing. You know, you can't unknow something. It's impossible. You know, I haven't shown that much of, like, who I am to my dad in general, but he can definitely tell that I've been shifting. I've verbalized it, and um, I have more and more opportunity to show him, so. How have you been phrasing it? Obviously, you've been having to learn how to translate things into a level that your dad can understand. So, I've been telling him how I've been interested in effects that the human mind has on the body, um, what thought patterns and stress patterns do to us, and how um, what we think about things has a pretty huge effect on how our life is. And I'm guessing, and I'm guessing you also told him because, well, what I'm about to say it's how I normally phrase this, but it's still a simple enough phrasing that any moron can get it. Um, the facts are irrelevant because we always take actions on our belief systems and it's those actions that have consequences because no matter which way you cut the mustard, you take an action, there's going to be a consequence. And your dad can definitely understand that idea. I'm not sure if I've told him exactly that. I may have, I may have not. Or something Um, similar to that, though. I'm not sure. Well, he obviously already knows that actions have consequences. I mean, that's that's about as old school as you can get. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. So if you add in and say, well, really, the facts of what anything actually is, 
is irrelevant because human beings act on belief systems and it's actions that have consequences. So if you're acting on belief systems instead of facts, actions have consequences. It doesn't matter that you might be acting on, on a belief system that's pure bullshit. If you're acting on it, there's going to be a consequence. There's going to be consequence. You know, you, you walk off a cliff. It doesn't matter if you ignore the fact of gravity. There's going to be a consequence for that. So that would be a good way, simple way of putting it to them as far as, you know, that, that we are actually able to manipulate our own perception of reality and see it as something that it's totally not, but it seems real to us. It's because we're taking action on our belief system. And when our belief systems are shitty, the world is shit, this is shit, there's nothing but shit, and so then we make shit choices, shit action with shit consequences, then we feel justified. Oh, see that? It's shit. I'm right. Oh, I've told him that before. <laughs> Um, so he understands that. He, he didn't fight you on that, did he? He's just kind of, kind of like, oh, no. you have a point. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been interested in this idea. Um, would there be any way for me to... Okay, do you remember how we were talking about how... We were talking about astral projection. Mm -hmm. And you were basically saying it's not a matter of projecting yourself anywhere. Cause it's you're, you're really a matter of... You're technically already everywhere. It's a matter of shifting your focus. Yeah. No, I have not learned how to shift focus quite like that. Okay. Although when, when, we're, when we're asleep, we all do it, and we call it dream. I know, and that's what I'm really interested in. Like, I want to shift my focus to back when I was a little kid. Hey, may I make a suggestion? Yeah. Seeing as astral projecting and dreaming are essentially the same thing anyway, instead of focusing on trying how to astral project, maybe research into how to better remember your dream. Or try a lucid dream. Like, I want to become conscious. Well, tech, well, here's the thing. Technically, you are. You just forget about it when you wake up. <clears throat> so it's not really about becoming conscious in your dream because you already are conscious in your dream. It's just that when you wake up, you forget. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, also, so here's it's the really, thing. It's about, I, it's about recall. It's about having better recall. In my dreams, though, like, there's so many things that I want to try out. I want to try out flying. I want to try out maybe something like skydiving. But I'm always doing something else. It's may I make never... a, may, may I suggest something? Sure. If you if in your dreams you are skydiving and flying and whatever else, but then when you wake up you forget it. It doesn't mean that you didn't do it. It just means that you forgot. <coughs> I remember most of my dreams. <laughs> well, here's another thing though. Even in remembering most of your dreams, you don't necessarily remember everything about a dream that you do remember. In other words, you might remember, okay, I had that dream and I can recall this, 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 and this. But if there's data missing, how would you know if you don't remember that there's data missing? You get my point? Okay, well, here's what I want to do. I would want to work on lucid dreaming, maybe in pair with trying to remember dreams more. Well, it's all the same thing. I'm just, I'm giving you a path to least resistance. You can take it or leave it. It's all the same thing. Yeah, if, like I'm saying, if you focus on dream recall, then the rest is just going to come naturally. I'll repeat again. If you're already doing all the stuff you're wanting to do, but you simply just do not remember it, because it's all about recall, then isn't it logical that improving recall would help you remember? Because again, I'll pose the question. If you did all that, but you don't remember it, then how are you supposed to know that you did all that if you don't remember it? Well, see, yeah, but I'm also saying, what if I didn't do it? Then I'm going to want a way to get all up in my dream and make the decisions like, hey, this is, I want to do this now. Let me, let me put it another way. Um, okay, so you're talking to me about all this stuff. You know what you want. You know what you want to do. If it's a matter of recall after you wake up and not a matter of being in the dream and recalling from <laughs> when you were awake, <clears throat> then I think it's quite logical that when you're dreaming, you'd be like, oh, yeah, I remember when I said I wanted to do this, this, and this. I'm going to do it. And then you do it. And then you don't remember that you did it. Whoop, back to square one. Get what I'm saying? It's still about recall. So you're saying the process of recalling the dream would also help the process of recalling the desires within the dream? I'm saying that when you're on that level, in the dream level, it's a more expanded consciousness, you 
when you're in the dream, you're lucid. There's full recall. You're on a higher vibrational level. It's just when you come back here, you don't remember all that. You, you don't remember the recall. You don't remember that you recalled anything. You don't recall that you recalled. Get it? Yeah, but I really... Let me, let me, let me, let me put it a, a different way. If you're on the ground, you can only see what's directly around you. If you get up in a helicopter, obviously you can see everything for miles and miles and miles and miles. So when you're up in the helicopter, there's the greater visibility. And the greater recall, you can see more, you can see farther, you're at a, literally a higher perspective. So obviously, you can see the ground from the air, right? Mm -hmm. But when you're on the ground, you can't see all that ground that you could see from the air. What you don't realize that you're saying to me is, but Dave, how do I get myself to have the view of being in the air while I'm in the air? It's like, well, you're in the air. Why wouldn't you have that view? Well, I, I just, I just wouldn't. I don't know why. No apparent reason. Societal programming. I'm being neurotic. I, I just wouldn't for no reason. Is, is a number five a bachelor or married? I, I don't get it. You know. So the point is, when you get back to the ground, you only have that limited ground view. So are you trying to tell me that if I'm in the dream perspective, since it's at a higher Level, that when you're, in the, when you're in the air, you're in the dream, you can see the ground. Right now, you're on the ground. You're awake. You're on the ground. The limited perspective only immediately around you. You're on the ground. When you're in the air, you can see the ground. You can see beyond, far, wide. So, of course... So, you're saying I would be able to see my desire to do things? Yeah. Can you can you see the ground when you're up in the in the air? Yeah. But when you're on the ground... Can you see all that ground that you could see from up above? No, you can only see your immediate surroundings. You don't have that huge view. You get what I'm saying? I'm doing my best to try to make this real simple. So, obviously, if you're up in the air looking at the ground, you can see the ground. Ground equals this conversation, seeing this conversation, full recall, full sight, sight, recall, expanded. You wake up, you're back on the ground, narrow, not so much recall, not so ex I just, you that get doesn't... What, you, get what, you, you get what I'm saying? It just seems so impossible to me. Well, let me, let me tell you... Every something. time I remember a dream, it's never anything that I want to do, and I remember most of my dreams. Hold on. It's never what I want to do. Hold on. It's random shit. Hold on. Check it out, check it out. If you have a belief system that fi filter that says, Dave, it's impossible, I'm not going to accept any other reality, then you already know that even if I'm handing you the answer, and even if the answer is simple and easy, as long as you say, nope, I'm only willing to believe that it's hard, it's impossible, it's this, nothing else can come through that, and you know that, and no one can force their will against yours and force you to, to, to take that down and let the information through. Remember, the facts are irrelevant. We take action based on our belief system. Remember that? All of a sudden you Yeah, I remember that, but also think about this. Is there a reason why the only dreams that I remember are nothing that I want to do? Yeah, there is. Same reason that when you're in certain moods and paradigms, you data block yourself. You data block from your ground level data, your awake reality data. There could be something that you, you knew an hour ago that you data block if you have a filter up that says, nope, I'm not willing to accept that into my into my awareness right now because then I couldn't feel justified if I, you know, it's, it's just, you, you know, we've, I mean, we've had plenty of experience with this. Like, lots and lots and lots. Happened more time than either of us can count. True? Do you recall that? I think that a lot of the times where I've been data blocking, quote unquote, it's because you'll phrase an idea in a different way, and like, I won't understand that it's that concept until after you talk about it some more. And also oftentimes, into your own admission, when I say something that is, when when you're in a in a bad mood and you're you're insisting on seeing yourself in a limited way or a bashing, berating way, you literally fight me when I say anything positive. You you justifiably, self righteously, unwaveringly defend your your perspective in that moment with a sword and a shield. You get what I'm saying? I highly doubt yeah. you're going to tell me, no, Dave, I never do that. <laughs> so it's okay. the same thing for dream recall. When you're, when you're in a, a, a just, okay, 
again, putting dreams aside, just regular reality. If you're in a justified mode, no, nope, this, this, and this is the only reality, nothing else, end of story. That's literally the only data you're seeing. So therefore, if you have a belief system that says, nope, I only recall this, this, and this about my dream because that's the belief system I have, and I'm not willing to accept that I'm, I'm capable of data blocking anything else. Somehow dreams are exempt. Somehow, for some reason, I think that, that, that I can't data block dreams. That, that all of the full memory of my dreams come through. Yet in real life, quote unquote, knock on wood, physical reality, whatever you want to call it. Oh, well, that I can data block. That's, that's no big deal. That's perfectly reasonable. All that information. But of course, when it comes to dreams, there's no way I could possibly data block. So obviously, all the data I'm seeing is all the data there is. You see how it's the same? I see how it's possibly the same. I mean, it's literally the same. It's how the brain works. When you're in a certain mood and mode, there are some neural networks that activate, others that shut down. It's like a computer. It's a configuration. Literally. Go try to argue with a neurologist, a biologist. Go try arguing with, with Bruce Lipton. He'll tell you, I they'll, they'll all tell you the same thing. A... The science is the science. But when the science contradicts the ego, <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I think... I don't like how narrow this perspective is, like, being on Earth. I wish I had more, like, six senses, I guess. You know what I mean. Energetic senses and shit. And I know what you're going to say. It's going to be like, well, it's a matter of, you know, releasing the things that are blocking you and allowing yourself to naturally, at your own pace, come across these things. But it's like, I want... Can I put something another way? You know those sure. those New Agers that think that they're... They're, they're unascended and they have to meditate and do this and that technique and whatever so that they can ascend into the higher vibration. That, that they're not ascended, but they're, they're working on ascending. They're working on their ascension. They're going to ascend. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Well, it doesn't occur to them that maybe they're already ascended and they have blindfolds on. And for that, I use the analogy... They're already in the room they want to be in. But if you have a blindfold on, you can't see the room, can you? I mean, if in doubt, put a blindfold on, a real big thick one, and try to see the room that you're in. You're not going to, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, a ma it's not a matter of ascending. It's a matter of taking off the blindfolds to realize that you're already ascended. Been there, done that already. It's done. It's just moving into the realization that it's already been done. Because That's obviously, really hard. obviously, if you if you have a blindfold on, you're not going to be able to see the furniture in the room or other people in the room or whatever. You might might bump into things. And what if you know it's like uh, like like um, you know Fantasia with Mickey Mouse and the furniture is alive and can jump around and move around and it's always changing positions. You're going to be uh -huh. bumping into a lot of stuff, right? Yeah. And then someone tells you, hey, it's not a problem if you take off the blindfold. You're like. What blindfold? I've got these demons attacking me, and I won't be able to get them to stop until I ascend to a higher dimension. It's just, it's so hard taking off these figurative blindfolds. I don't even know where the fuck they are, what okay. they check, now check it feel out. like. I don't know any of it. I don't know what's blocking me off from it. Hey, hold on. That's fine. That's completely fine. Now check this out. You already know that if you get impatient with something and, and try to try to do it too, too, too fast that it's going to fail. Like, imagine you have, um, like, like Christmas lights. You've, you've put up Christmas lights before, I'm sure. When the lights, uh -huh. when the lights are all tangled up and you got to untangle it, do you think that grabbing the wires as hard as you can and pulling as fast as you can and as hard as you can and pulling and squeezing and pulling and stretching, does, is that going to untangle the lights or is that going to make the knots tighter? It's going to make the knots a lot tighter. Yeah. So you know common sense that you have to calm down and slowly untangle the lights. And you know that might take a while. might be a little tedious. But you know that that's the way to do it. You understand the simple physics of that. It's a no-brainer that you don't pull and stretch and, and all that. Right? Well, what if you had a belief system that you do pull and stretch and all that? And what if the idea of just calm down and slowly untangle it, what if that sounded like complete bullshit? Would you ever untangle the lights? No. Not until 
you eased up on yourself, lightened up, took a chill pill, relax, open your mind to the idea that maybe there's a whole lot of things that are actually easier than the fucking educational system Nazis lied to you about. And that maybe it's simply a matter of eventually coming to the point of not believing in those lies anymore. Well, Dave, how do I not believe in the lies anymore? Well, that's actually, well, I'm, I'm going to say easy in the sense that conceptually it's easy. Mm -hmm. um, when you've had the crap kicked out of you enough that you become desperate enough to surrender, like when you hit that fuck it point, like, all right, all right, I'm willing. I'm tired of being beaten. I'm tired of being kicked. I'm tired of bleeding. I'm willing. I surrender. Okay. Enough. Stop. Have I reached that point? With some things. Not all. Okay. Yeah. There is no human that ever reaches that point with all paradigms simultaneously. Do doesn't happen. You know what I mean? It, it, yes. if, if that could happen, like, you know, you'd have, like, people that are 16-year-olds suddenly having the knowledge of, like, hundred year olds and you know yesterday they were they were doing algebra and, and you know t today they're building a goddamn warp drive you know what I mean? you know, that just that doesn't happen like that yeah and that's okay yeah so you hit your fuck it point with some things not all things you're wanting to hit it with all things at once yeah i am and that in itself is neurotic Un yes neurotic. that in itself is neurotic Delusional. <laughs> and I don't, mean, I, I, I don't mean that as a diss. I'm not mocking you. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just pointing, I'm pointing it out so it's easier for you to see. So you're not looking at it like Dave. I, no, you're I, right. I, I don't know how I could believe that, Dave. That's just a little too far out there. I'm just putting it out there so that it's so obvious. Like, oh, okay, I could see that. Like, the sky's blue, the grass is green. All right, that's easy. Well, it's like here's how I picture it being. We were talking about it. There's the hard way, which. You can have, obviously, you can reach your fucking point multiple times regarding different subjects. Um, and there's the easy way where, like, the older generations, oh, they would pride themselves on their arrogance and their fear tactics. They would, they would never miss the opportunity to go up to the kids and go, listen, kids, if you don't stop doing this, then I'm going to call the police. So you either stop doing that, or you get out of the store and don't come back. Or I'm going to call the police if you disobey. <laughs> you wouldn't ha quietly hide behind somewhere and call the cops on a bunch of kids that are doing basically nothing but mild annoyance. They they love that you know these adults back then. They uh, love nothing more than to get up in the kids' face and show off their almighty superiority. Quietly calling yeah. the cops over nothing would have deprived them of being able to get off on their own control freakiness. And I think nowadays, calling the cops makes them feel maybe more justified. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's turning into a goddamn nanny state. Cops are becoming babysitters and Heil fucking Hitler at the exact same time. Everybody's yep. being trained that any little tiny thing you don't like, you call the cops. As a matter of fact, even the cops here will say... Oh, you see something going on? Call the cops. You don't like to, like something? Call the cops. Don't handle anything yourself. Let the cops handle it. Yep. And I'm Just looking at them like, what? Uh-uh. I'm like, no, fuck that. I call the cops only if they're needed as the last resort. Not every little deep fucking day. Oh, no. That's what? bullshit. I agree. And, like, there's so many important things where people do actually need to be protected. And if cops are going on call over bullshit like that, and it's just like, no where kidding. are our priorities at? Or what do we really care about? And, you, know the, that, you know, the cops don't like the policy much either. Um, I bet they don't. The, the cops are told that, that they have to tell people to call the cops for every little thing. They don't want to go out on babysitting duty. Right. I mean, hell, what, what, sense, what, which, what, what sense which would call the cops on us constantly, and the cops would show up, you know, for obviously it's going to be over nothing. We'd be like, oh, the babysitters are here. And they'd be like, what? It's like, well, she's using you guys as babysitters. You know, right. She looks out her window. She just don't don't like the way we're blinking our eyes or something. She'll call the police. I mean, you know, any little stupid thing. So she's treating you like her, like her babysitters. 
She don't like that doo 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 and wah wah, so, eh, you know, babysitting duty. And we said, yeah. we, we said, we don't think it's fair. You guys got better things to do. But, you know, and sometimes when we when we didn't use the babysitter's line, they'd they'd walk up and, and we'd be like, oh, are you here to save us from the terrorists next door? But it got to a point where she wasn't able to call the cops anymore. You know why? Why? Throughout the whole thing, when the cops showed up, she uh, she would always be friendly and try to play it like she's a victim, right? Well, she had an arrogant ego the size of the universe that was growing increasingly more impatient with every failure. You know that that has a limit. You know eventually she's going to lose containment and blow up and start showing her true colors, right? Yes. Well, that day came one day. The cops go over by her to try, try to talk to her and everything. All of a sudden, we hear her screaming at the cops. And then all of a sudden, she shuts up. She gets real quiet. Cops come walking out, walk over to us, look at us, and say, you won't have to worry about her anymore. And they get back into the car and they go. And I know what they told her, too. When she showed her true colors, they said, you call us for anything anymore, you're getting locked up. Good. Oh, yeah. So people like that, like Fence Witch, they, they have a limit to how long they can fake something, how long they can put on an act before they get more and more impatient. See, that's another factor about remaining in your preferred state of being as well. When you remain in your preferred state of being, you weaken your enemy exponentially. <laughs> how has it worked with your dad, case in point? Pretty well. Because you start defying his reality with your state of being. He's got a certain set of rules that says reality operates one way, and that's it. It's not that he's just simply trying to be a Nazi, like, I don't care about all the other ways. I only want my way. He thinks his way is literally the only way that exists. Doesn't know any other way. Fish in water, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So when you do things that defy his reality, it's almost like you're working some kind of magic from his perspective. Like, you got a magic wand up your butt. Like, how is she doing the impossible? And that's that's how he beat Fence Witch. Fence Witch had a certain reality construct in her mind. She didn't believe there was such a thing as being kind, being nice, being being patient, being wise, being anything. She thought that when anything seemed to be like that, it was just an act. It was a front. It was a scam. It was schmoozing. She thinks that because that's what she does. That's how she acts. That's how she operates. She thinks the way she operates is the way everybody operates. That's the only reality from her point of view. It's not like she actually thinks, okay, I have my mode of operation and everybody else has theirs. And theirs are different. And I don't like theirs. I like mine because mine is better. That's not what she's thinking. She's thinking there's only one reality, and that's the way I see it. That's the way everybody else sees it, because there's only one reality. That's why everybody can agree that the, the, the grass is green and the sky is blue, because there's only one reality. Therefore, the way I perceive reality is the way to perceive reality. There's no other way. You can't change a, a brick into a bird. A brick is a brick, a bird is a bird. There's only one reality. So she literally thought that the way she perceived reality is absolutely the way reality is, period, finito, absolutely. Which is why, like, you, um... So I understood her Acting psychology. any differently, she thought you were being a bullshitter. Oh, yeah, exactly. She thought I, I... Basically, she's the type of person... Here's her paradigm. Everybody's out to get you, so if you don't control everybody else around you, they're going to control you. Typical Illuminati globalist elite fucking paradigm. Honestly, that's the way they feel, too. These 1% bitches. They're all fence witches, okay? But with a lot of money. Um, so it's like she's thinking it's either control or be controlled. And she's a really good game player. I mean, I'll give her credit. She's good. But I've had enough experience to see through all of it. But she's used to being able to play everybody because she's used to um, the people around her being exponentially more stupid than she is. So she's uh -huh. used to being able to play the game and winning. So just like the globalist elite, she's not used to losing. Losing isn't in her reality. She always wins because she, she's always dealing with people that are infinitely more stupid than her. 
Just like with the elites, from their perspective, they always win because they're always dealing with people significantly less enlightened than they are. And they always did win, and she always did win. They're used to it. All of a sudden, everything changes. They don't know how to operate in this, yet they're still thinking that reality is the way it's ever been. So the more contradictions they see, at first they're thinking, oh, okay, I see. There's just a master bullshit game going on here. Oh, they're good, they're good. So that's the first thing a fence witcher and Illuminati think. They see something genuine. They think genuine. There's no such thing. It's like Santa Claus. Tooth Fairy doesn't exist. This is obviously just a really expert con. So they try to out-con the con artist without realizing there's no con. Mm -hmm. And when there's, when there's no con, all the rules of operation for dealing with con artists don't apply. And then they don't know what the fuck to do. Just like the rules of, of riding a bicycle don't apply to a semi-truck or a jet plane. Oh, well, what if someone thought they did? <laughs> Ooh, big trouble. <laughs> so, that's why Fence Witch lost. And really, what was there for her to win? That little, she didn't want you to put up your fence? Is that really well, well, she well, she's, well, no, she's the one who, want, who put up the fence. I, oh, okay. I, you, you, you don't know the whole story yet. You only know the highlights. But, no, I already told you what her objective was. In her belief structure, there's only two options. Control everyone around you or be controlled. That's the Illuminati perspective. So, okay. what she was trying to quote-unquote win was just each battle. There was no ultimate win for her. It was just survival mode. Continuity of her own preservation. The idea of thinking that if she doesn't win, her continuity is in danger. Because her belief system is control others or be controlled by others. No other reality exists. It's the same belief system that the elites have. It's just so strange to me because, like, I've talked a little bit with your dad. Talked quite a bit with you. Your mom seems like she's a nice little lady. Um, Like, how do you have really just non-invasive neighbors? I mean, obviously, this is someone who is grasping for control. It's just like, she didn't even realize what good neighbors she had. Yeah. She well, didn't realize how you guys she's, really... She's gone now, obviously. Yeah. The property owners moved in, and they're nice. <laughs> just more irony. Oh, there were tons of synchronistic ironies. Like, around the time she was evicted, that whole section that used to be our garden area that got blocked off, but of course our flowers just grew out of control back there at that point. That yes. whole area got really saturated with mustard garlic. It still is. And I was making oh. and I was making jokes like, you know, when you got that much of a garlic build up, a vampire's gotta leave. Oh. <laughs> oh my gosh, yes. That's hilarious. Yeah, so lots of little funny synchronicity. And also, mustard garlic is probably pretty useful. Well, it's an herb, it's a spice. I mix it with my little mixes here and put it in my food, just like with everything else. It's nutrients. Yay. I mean, I don't harvest any of it on the other side of the fence, of course. I don't need to. I've got my own on my own side. Oh. Do, so they just let it grow? Well, yeah. As a matter of fact, the funny thing is, we're on such good terms that if we need to do anything in their yard whatsoever, regardless, we are free to go in there without needing permission in advance. Oh, they're the neighbors that let you do that? Yeah, next door. That's where Fence would be. Or, oh, okay. no, or, or no, you're confusing. No, no, Lynn, uh, Lynn, who's on the one side, it's got the smart meter. I'm saying she wouldn't mind us going in and, you know, taking the radiation scans. I'm talking okay. about something different. I'm talking about on the other side, they don't really care that much what we do as in a more in-depth sense. Like, you know, if we want to dig up any plants from in there, if we want to put any plants in there, if we want to trim trees, whatever we want to actively do, they don't care. It's fine. They're like, sure. Wow, because they know that you guys are good people. Yeah. Not going to fuck with their stuff. They're like, we don't, well, they got, don't really have any quote-unquote stuff back there anyway. I mean... The uh, the only surviving plants that are back there is all our flowers and stuff that, you oh. know, we used to have organized and and growing, you know, in the one spot before, you know, the fence went up and blocked it off. But once that was blocked off, then we had no way of keeping control over the flowers, so they just went crazy everywhere. Well, I'd rather it be flowers than weeds, though. <laughs> and, of course, um, because... That section connects in to the border of their front lawn. Uh -huh. 
even now, their front lawn is dominated with flowers. Wow. It's like oh, there's only half the grass left in there that was there. <laughs> it's like, oh, so you hate flowers. My shit's invading anyway. Here's a little more, and by a little, I mean a lot. <laughs> oh, yeah, so we totally loaded up, and not to mention, on the... Uh, on the on the uh, the border thing that that um we built as a separator between our side of the property and their front lawn, mm-hmm. um, she she liked having her view down the street, right? So that was part of the incentive for us planting a row of trees right there. It's like, oh, so you like your view? Bye bye view. That was point one. Yeah. Um. Point number two was to also plant as many invasive species in that or plant in that border area as possible so that <clears throat> it would all contaminate their lawn. Oh, I mean, wow. I'm talking ivy vines, various other types of vines that grow by both root and seed, flower trees that seed, various other types of flowers that not only seed, but they have a distribution system similar to a dandelion. That shit's airborne. It gets a full spread over the whole lawn when the wind picks up. Um, I'm talking um, raspberry plants, wild rose bushes that do multiply. Um, every type of invasive freaking anything that I could freaking get my hands on, I put in there. And Holy of course, cow, that's great. I mean, the seed stuff gets farther. The roots, the rooted stuff didn't get as far, but my God, the seed stuff, that shit's all over that front lawn still. It's continuing to invade. How long ago was that? Um, we started the seed bombardments in, uh, 2011. <laughs> uh, nature's been kind of, well, we did it 2011, 2012. She got evicted just before the consciousness shift in 2012. Little Mayan end date there. Ever since, you know, we have obviously haven't done anything, but nature does it for us. Yes. I mean, that shit's on autopilot now. It's like once it, once it gets going, it's really hard to stop it. Once that gets embedded in there, it's embedded in there. Good fucking luck. Because we don't grow little pussy flowers that die easily. We grow flowers that you could spray, spray them with weed killer and half of it or more will come back anyway. We grow the type of flowers that you could, you could churn up the frickin' dirt, cut into it with spades and chop it up and everything else. Wait a few weeks, it's coming right back up like, you, like nothing ever even fucking happened. <laughs> we don't, we don't got pussy flowers. She tried everything. It aggravated the fucking shit out of her that no matter what, these things just came back up. And all it is is flowers. Like, who hates flowers? I don't get it. I don't really... I mean, we would joke about her hating flowers. I don't think she liked or hated them. It's just that we mm-hmm. liked gardens. So that mm-hmm. was just an avenue of attack that she was using. Even though they're just harmless little cute plants. But... Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, is she, is she figured, okay, if I can bug the owners into fencing that area off, because we had had a part of our garden in there for the better part of 20-plus years. Oh. And it was never a problem. I mean, I was able to transplant a lot of stuff out of there and, and, you know, move it before the fence went up. But, you know, she's thinking, all right, well, if I do that, they're going to be really mad, and it's it's going gonna, it's gonna to really cause a problem for them, and they're going to get hot and bothered, and when they're totally into fear and anger, then I'll be able to control them. It's an Illuminati thinking. Same fucking mm-hmm. But instead, we we freaking you know the 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 part um it's oh it's really hard to like explain without showing you I'll have to show you one of these days when your bandwidth is better um but where the fence was and then stopped it's like obviously there's an invisible line that keeps going across the lawn because there there wasn't any defined property borders there are now <laughs> but there was oh. there wasn't then. So, but I knew where the property lines are and shit. So, I, you know, I built my own, you know, divide. And she saw that I built that, you know, the trees and the flowers and the vines. And she also liked, you know, spying and keeping an eye on things. So, obviously, going all the way back along our side of the fence, you know, we built the vine trellis and the rows of trees and vines and bushes and everything else, totally blocking this fucking cunt out, like, you know, like she doesn't even exist. So... And she did wow. not like that. It's like, 
they were supposed to get mad. Instead, they're planting more trees, they're planting more flowers, they're taking areas that used to be grass on their side and turning them into flower areas and doing all this stuff and putting all this stuff in my way. Now there's more garden there than there was before. Fuck. <laughs> Salty ball. And plus, she wasn't really able to eliminate the spot that we had. It's just that at that point, we couldn't go in there. But what she didn't realize is that we were laughing about the fact that we couldn't go in there. It's like, oh, well, that's funny because us going in there means that we can manually keep that garden in check so that it doesn't cross certain lines. It doesn't get out of control without us being able to go <laughs> in there. Nature puts its full frickin' throttle into things. Now there's no control mechanism keeping it from going crazy and spreading everywhere into the lawn and beyond. So she didn't understand why I was laughing. Just like, <laughs> it's like, it's like wait laughing. a minute, I just took this area away from them. Why are they laughing? They're just building other areas and putting stuff there. They're laughing that they can't get into that other area. Why are they laughing? I don't get it. <laughs> It's like we're laughing because we were the only thing keeping keeping human infrastructure and nature in in the in the balance that humans want. Yeah. Without that maintenance, it's full blown one hundred percent nature unchecked. Oh my god. Okay. For one thing, that's perfect because it's gonna freak her the fuck out. And also I just got this visual like aggressively throwing seeds onto her yard and it's just so funny because it's like it's <laughs> It's so funny that that literally could offend someone. It's just, it's just seeds. Oh, that's funny. So uh -huh. how did she react to the garden getting out of control on her side? Well, she thought that just having it cut down with the lawnmower would solve the problem and kill the plants. But you see, the types of plants that we that we planted in there, first of all, anything that grew by seed... The plants had been in there for so long that the dirt is super saturated for at least a few inches down with all the different seeds for stuff. Mm -hmm. It gets mowed down, the dirt gets churned up, the dormant seeds activate, it all springs up like a goddamn jungle. That's point one. Point two is that the other half of the stuff multiplies by root. And if you got something that the primary means of multiplication is by root, and you're constantly cutting off the top of it so it can't grow up, and it's something that multiplies by root. And instead of focusing half of its energy on upward growth and half of its energy on multiplication, now it's focusing 100% of its energy on multiplication. <laughs> That's salty. All she did was make it spread faster. She accelerated it. And then plus, another cool, sneaky fucking thing that I did. Um, <clears throat> to water... Um, my, my side, you know, like on an automated, you know, sprinkler thing, mm -hmm. obviously I could have tried to be careful and position it so that the water only hit our side and so on and so forth. But I made sure the water hit both sides, our side and her side. <laughs> because the thing is, water is not all that was running through it. You know those little little fertilizer containers that you, you, you clamp on um, either at the end of oh. at the end of the hose with the sprayer or between two hoses, and yes. you have your fertilizer mix in, and the water runs through it, and then it it, it dilutes the fertilizer so that it could spread out to a farther area for longer. Mm -hmm. Let me put it this way: I know lots and lots of the right things that most people don't even know they could put in their gardens to massively accelerate its growth. So I put I would be making up super steroid not literally, I'm being figurative, um super steroid fertilizer cocktails that would send all the plants into hyper accelerated growth. <laughs> so all that nutrient got saturated into the dirt on her side and ours. <clears throat> And so now she's she's mowing the stuff down to focus the plant's attention on root multiplication to create more plants. And now they're su super turbocharged with this <laughs> fertilizer on freaking steroids. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. Like, time she goes out there to mow it, it's bigger and bigger. 
And you know what? Well, I mean, there there was a janitorial staff that came out about, you know, at least twice a month to do it. She was so bossy that eventually there were no more crews that would work there. So nothing oh, wow. was getting cut anymore. The grass. This is hilarious. <laughs> the grass got three and four feet high. Oh, shit. That was awesome. Did this bitch not like to mow her lawn? She's a lazy cunt. <laughs> She's thinking, well, you know, I'm just renting here. It's not my property. It's not my responsibility. So if they're not going to do it, I don't care. But at the same time, that was also driving her nuts because it's like, but wait a minute, if no one's cutting, then my next door neighbors are winning. Fuck. So she was really caught between paradigms with that one. Damn. So because she's on sec she's on Section 8, all she could do was call Section 8 out to bitch about the lawn to then force the the landlords to come and, and you know, and cut it themselves. But it took a long time to get to that point. And the landlords only would come out to cut it at that point when it started getting super excessive. They wouldn't, like, cut it every week or anything. Oh, good. They shouldn't have to. Because, um, you know, we we warned them. Because they were like, you know... Can't you just try to get along with her and so on and so forth? And we're like, look, mark our words. Once she figures out that fucking with us is a lost cause and it will not work, the only people she will have left to fuck with is you. And she will turn all of her dirty tricks on you. Mm -hmm. They found out the hard way. Not only did they have to go through all sorts of hell and harassment with her, but that cunt did three grand worth of damage in that in that house by the time she was evicted. Oh uh, well, that sucks for them. You want well, well, to not, Well, not really. I mean, I look at it this way: if they wanted to learn the lesson that way, more power to them. That's their free will right to get bent over and raped. It's not like they weren't real. I don't understand. We are on really, really, really good terms with them. That doesn't mean that we're good friends. It doesn't mean that they like us or vice versa. It doesn't mean there is any kind of closeness. It doesn't mean that whatever they might think about us that's negative, that's unspoken, isn't being thought. And it certainly doesn't prevent us from thinking that stupid is as stupid does, and they're a bunch of fucking idiots. It doesn't stop any of those processes, which just goes to show all opinions are irrelevant. As long as you agree to just be neighborly, you don't have to like each other. Yeah. All you have to do is not fight. And when you're not fighting, you end up helping each other. Not because you're pals, but because it's mutually beneficial. We do things for them, they do things for us. Aww. It's a mutually beneficial alliance. It has nothing to do with anybody liking anybody. The neighborly Kelsos. It has nothing to do with positive opinions, as a matter of fact. Our next-door neighbor, Lynn, to one side, is an arrogant, stupid, control freak, not nearly as bad as a fence switch, don't get me wrong. She's just got a control freak attitude, like, you know, my way is the holy gospel. But she talks like that in conversation about things. It's not like she's trying to fuck with us, it's just, if words come out of her mouth and words are coming out of your mouth to form a conversation, it's going to be one in which... She's acting arrogant about whatever it is that you're talking about. You know what I mean? Oh, okay. But she's not a troublemaker. But she is a stupid, arrogant cunt. She doesn't like us. We don't like her. But we get along. We help each other. There's no fighting. Yeah. And next door, they think we're entertaining but crazy. And we think they're decent and polite but really fucking stupid morons. But we get along. It's mutually beneficial. Nobody has to all like each other. Nobody has to agree about everything. That's what people don't understand about world peace. World peace isn't everybody singing kumbaya around the campfire and agreeing on everything. World peace is simply just an end of conflict. Uh -huh. End of conflict is easy. Stop fucking with your neighbor. It's easy. Yeah. Stop spending energy to go out of your way to fuck with your neighbor. That ends conflict instantly. It's not hard. 
Then you don't have well, to like, you don't have to like each other. You can disagree right. on most things and still cooperate with each other in all instances where it is mutually beneficial to do so. I agree. That's and what you're, I do, you're, you're selfishly doing it for your own continuity, and so are they. But it's mutually beneficial. So there's peace. There's cooperation. There is no conflict. That's what peace is. It doesn't mean everybody agree, everybody like each other, everybody get along. It means don't fuck with your neighbor. That's what peace is. Simple. Don't fuck with your neighbor. <laughs> Uh -huh. That's all it is. That doesn't mean get along. That doesn't mean like each other. That doesn't mean agree on everything. It means don't fuck with your neighbor. Respect <laughs> your neighbor. Give your neighbor the respect you would want from them. It's, yep. every, it's everything that Jesus said. And it's really fucking simple because it doesn't require you changing. It doesn't require anyone changing. You know, it's, it's not. E it's not down e the fucking. It's not even. Aggressive. It's not even do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It's more like, don't fuck with your neighbor as you would not want them to fuck it with you. <laughs> it's that simple. Let's make a video about this, me and you. Yeah, no kidding. And whoever else. Dude, and, seriously. <laughs> we could make this into a good video. Well, technically, see... We it, have already done that. Uh, I know. Technically, yeah. Right. I think... And there's only a couple of small personal detail parts that I would cut out, as you know. But beyond that, it's all usable. What do you mean it's all usable? Everything we discussed about that. It's oh, usable. yeah. Skype recorder. Oh, really? Yeah, it's automatic. You know that. I've told you that before. Okay, yes, you did. Um, yes, we can use parts from this call, obviously. I mean, I don't... I don't... Excerpt? Yeah, I mean, I don't you know, use private data publicly without, you know, permission, oh, no. obviously. Don't fuck with your neighbor. Exactly. <laughs> exactly like what we're talking about here. Don't fuck with your neighbors. You would not them fucking with you. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah, and so then we could also uh, um, do a little more discussion about it sometime with some more people. It'd be, it'd be cool. Yeah. I mean, obviously there are topics that continue to reoccur. Yeah. It's not Topics like, that it's probably not, need to reoccur. Not like you talk about something once and then, oh, okay, it's banned forever. No. <laughs> right. Like, that would be a little scary. Issues are not so easily resolved. They need to keep being talked about. Yeah. yeah. Not in the sense of, like, oh, woe is me, here's this issue, whatever shall we do, but just, you know, talking about it in ways that are about practicality and about solutions and about dichotomies and about paradigms and calling a spade a spade and pointing out the elephant in the room, <laughs> you know, just, you know, continuing that information flow, not trying to force anything down anyone's throat, but just continuing that flow of information. Form some neural networks, get the blood flow into new areas. Of the and body. obviously as humanity continues to awaken and we all learn our own individual lessons and so on and so forth, over time, these situations do change. They do They do have marked progress. I mean, we're a lot more awake and aware now than we were in 2012. And a lot more awake and aware in 2012 than we were, well, really at any point prior. Yeah. 2012 Wait, was just... What was 2012? What was the 2012 paradigm shift that you mentioned earlier? Well, you know the whole thing about the mind prophecy? Yes. Yeah. Obviously, it wasn't the end of the world unless we're looking at a really living like afterlife and we just don't know it somehow. Um, so obviously, the world did not end on December 21st, 2012, although a particular fence witch's world ended metaphorically, which I find <laughs> ironic as shit. But really, it was just the end of the world as we know it. And the Mayans understood time, they understood math, they understood long cycles, they were obsessed. And so, is it really prophecy if you've simply figured out a pattern of energy, patterns of time, patterns of just how nature works? I mean, is it really prophecy if I say, later this year, winter will come. Ooh, I am an all-powerful prophet. I see the winter. No. It's an understanding of natural cycles, particularly the four seasons. It's pretty basic. Yes. There are all sorts of cycles for all different levels of things that span much, you know, longer amounts of time. So but the, the physics kind of, it's kind of like going up a hill, 
getting to the top and then going back down the other side. December 21st, 2012 was like the top of the hill. So obviously, thousands of years going up, I mean, going uphill is obviously a lot more challenging than going downhill, right? Mm-hmm. Well, now we're going downhill, and on the other side of this hill, there's lots of snow, nothing in our way, and we're in sleds. And gravi- oh, wow. gravity is doing what it does. You know what I mean? Okay, so how, um, how was 1987 or 89 or whatever the year that... 87. 87, that we actually went from we could destroy ourselves to you we're going to... The 1987 harmonic conversion. Our, yes. Well, to put it simply, you kind of think of that almost as like um, like a little match that lights a fire, so to speak. Mm-hmm. It's not it's not the fire. It's a little match. Okay. And the consciousness of humanity lit that match with the decision of, well, we're not going to blow ourselves up. And then within two years, Berlin Wall fell and all that. But... If we've decided we're not going to destroy ourselves, and so we get to the top of this 2012 hill, and we're still not destroyed, and sailing back down the other side, we're not destroyed, that means there's a default responsibility for dealing with our demons, facing our shit, clearing our paradigms, cleaning up our messes. We've made a mess of things. So we're working things out, coming to understanding. And a lot of that is really messy, really painful, you got the would-be globalist elites all butthurt. Well, the old stuff isn't working anymore. We try to put people into fear, and it just wakes more people up. What's the You know? Mm-hmm. So they get increasingly butthurt. And then as the people start to awaken and slowly, well, when I say slowly, I mean a hell of a lot, uh, infinitely faster than the past. It's still slower mm-hmm. than, like, slowly starting to realize, oh, my God, you know, uh, Wow, we've really been getting fucked here. It's wow, my ass really hurts. Yeah. That's that's not information that um is very pleasant. And we've been trained to handle things more neurotically and hostily than pissed off little toddlers on crack. The educational system has not taught us how to be calm and rational and patient or any of that. Quite the opposite, not the system. So Humanity starts to awaken, and the first thing it does is freak out. <laughs> mm-hmm. So we're going through a little freak out tantrum. The globalists are going through their freak out tantrum. We're going through ours. Wow. You get what I'm saying? The and globalists are like, oh crap, reality wasn't like what we always thought it was, and now we're butthurt because we can't control the people. And then on our side, it's like, oh crap, same. Reality wasn't what we thought it was. And now we can't have our sense of control through feeling victimized and justified. We're realizing we have to take responsibility. Oh, crap. And there are those that see this and they're like, all right, I can roll with that. You know, it's got to be better than what we've been doing. Uh-huh. And then, of course, there's people who are just going to hold on to the old paradigm to the last second, cover their ears and hum. I don't want to hear it. It's all conspiracy nonsense. Shut up. I'm right. You're wrong. I'm William Black, and I don't want to have a dialogue unless it's my log in your anus. La, 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 la. I'm not listening. You know. Um, okay, this might seem like a far-out question, but, uh... Ask me what? Um, <laughs> one second. Okay. What do you think that alien or other forms of intelligence in the universe, what we would call alien, think of the processes that humanity is going through, like... Here's a question. You think, the, you, you think the universe is a fractal, right? Mm-hmm. Repeating patterns. Oh. And these quote-unquote aliens, as we call them, but they're not really alien. Again, I, I, before I use the analogy of Nemo, you know, finding Nemo, you know, as if the the father in search of Nemo is like, oh, I've left my world. I'm in an alien ocean. Oh, look at Dory, this annoying, scatterbrained alien. As I meet aliens and go through this alien world, completely oblivious that it's all the same ocean. No, that kind of didn't happen, and yeah, it's all the same ocean. Um, so obviously, as I was explain, explaining, DNA being not life, but the building blocks of life, it doesn't have any specific temperature requirements or anything. It's activated by environment, so DNA is all over the damn place. It's a four-bit programming code, essentially. So, obviously, we're a part of a bigger ocean. 
So when we use the term alien, what we're really trying to say is we've bumped into something that we're not necessarily familiar with. We've bumped into Dory, so to speak, mm -hmm. in, a, in a manner of speaking. Like not necessarily from Earth. Yeah, but if Earth is a part of a greater ocean, so to speak. Right. Exactly. So, um, got to figure, if there's a lot of other races, realities, whatever out there that have had no problem traversing the galaxy, the universe, the multiverse, the multiverses, whatever, <laughs> you know, to them it's like hopping in a car and driving down the street. And they've had experiences doing that for millions of years. Well, then what about, what about before then? They had to have started from some point, right? Mm -hmm. So if everything's a fractal, then what if the lessons we're learning and the things we're going through, what if it's just a natural part of planetary evolution? What if they're looking at us the same way we look at two, and I don't mean this like in an insulting, belittling way, but we look at two trout mating. In other words, it's not a big deal. It's nature. It's okay. We know what that is. It's fish. Fish lay eggs. They swim around. They dance. They do their thing. The eggs are made. The baby fish hatch. It's not this big mystery to us. It's not like, oh my God, what are those <laughs> trout doing? Jeez, wow. We just, we've just never seen that before. We don't know what that is. You know, oh my course, God. So if this is something that's very common and it would be very familiar to a civilization that from their time perspective of time, their own timeline within their reality, that they have got millions of years of experience racked up. Well, that, don't, don't you think that they'd be viewing us kind of like the way we'd, we'd view the trout? Like, oh, okay, we know what that is. Two fish doing their dance, laying the eggs. We know what happens next. More trout, you know. We, we know it's a natural process. We know they're fish. We know what they do. It's not this big flipping mystery. So why would what we're going through now be any big flipping mystery to them? It wouldn't. They've seen it before. They've gone through it themselves. They've been around longer. Wow. From a linear perspective, anyway. Humans are babies. Yeah, I mean, technically all time exists at once and all that, but mm -hmm. every there's different points of consciousness and different linear perspectives, like, you know, even if we had frickin' Doctor Who's TARDIS, <laughs> it's like even yeah. even Doctor Who views things linearly. Yes, what, he does. What just happened to him before was his past. What's happening to him now is his present. What will happen to him is his future. So yes, as, 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 as where a it person... Is on the timeline. Yeah, as a person, he has his own timeline, his own linear timeline. But because he's a time traveler, and he's not limited by the bounds of space and time... His own timeline is his own. It's personal. It's not a shared, absolute shared reality to where him yep. and a bunch of other people are locked into it, you know? So obviously, um, because time is relative, all these other different civilizations um, are going to have their, their own view of that. You know what I mean? Yeah, and who knows? They probably already know how to travel through time. Well, space and time is the same thing. You know, you can't really go interstellar without doing both. We live in a multiverse, not a universe. We just haven't quite figured that one out yet, not completely. True. But, you know, you get my point. Yes. Time is just um, a, a, a temporal location. It would be more accurate to to say that, you know, um, in, instead of, oh, well, uh, you, you were born in 1998, to say... You are being born in uh -huh. 1998, because 1998 is a temporal location existing in parallel with this one. So, in another universe, there's, there's me constantly being born in that hospital room, even though I could go and visit that hospital room in this time period. They're two different places relative to the universe, the multiverse. Two different temporal locations. If you see time as a where and not as a when, or you see okay. when as just another type of where. Obviously, okay. Chicago and New York can coexist on the same continent. One doesn't have to be born, live, and die, and then the other be born, live, and die, and then Phoenix is born and lives in yeah. that, and then San Diego is born and lives in that. They're all existing simultaneously on the same continent. Well, think of the, so, con the continent as space-time, and think of each city as a temporal location. New York is 1950, Chicago is 1990, Phoenix is... 2020, San Diego is, you know, the year 3000, whatever. You get what I'm saying? Okay. See, see, yes, when, see when as being a type of where. Because mm -hmm. it really is, because all these different time periods exist 
the same as as if they were different places, yes. And remember how I said, I was talking about superposition, and there's all these different probabilities that coexist? Mm-hmm. It means there's more than one past, more than one... It is and isn't. Yeah. It is both, it is neither. Yeah, but more importantly than that, there's more than one past, more than one present, more than one future. All these different freaking parallels. All these different possibilities. And, like, I always like to think of the idea, there's just, there's an infinite number of universes because... If you think about it, if one person on Earth, say they make a decision, and, like, every time one person makes a decision, that universe splits off into two different ways. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's a universe, there's a universe where they made this decision, and there's a universe where they made the opposite decision. Or... If everything is in parallel, then every second is a universe unto itself. Yes. Interesting. And every second has in- infinite superposition probability versions of itself. So, in the second... This is only our version of that second. What we are perceiving is our version of that second. Mm-hmm. There's infinite other parallel versions of that second. You yes. Know what I'm saying? Not to mention what everyone else in the world right now is going through. So another time is another parallel, and a parallel is another universe. So even wow. even what we think yes. of as being our universe is if oh we have this one universe and this universe has a past and a present and a future. You're not quite. It's different. Ten, yes. year, ten years ago is a parallel universe to now. Twenty years from now is a parallel universe to now. Because when is a type of where. It can't help but be a parallel mm-hmm. universe. And also think about the time between seconds. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, Nassim Harriman already discovered that you can you can take a perimeter and divide it into infinities of infinities. Yes. So if if, uh, if one second is a perimeter, is a border that you're creating, you can divide that border into infinite infinities. Mm-hmm. So let's not and, uh, talk about the space between seconds, because there's infinite infinities <laughs> in seconds. And like, okay, what you just told me, time and space exist at one point. You think of time as another dimension, basically, what yeah. we were just talking about. Like, so yes. Exactly. Is, you're literally, you're moving. Remember when you were talking about dreaming? Uh-huh. Well, have you ever had a dream that seems to take longer than the time you were actually asleep? Yeah. That's because in that perspective, you know, that where your focus of consciousness is in that dream, you're technically not in this time frame anymore. You're in something else. Interesting. So you could experience what is what you think is five hours there. 30 minutes here, mm-hmm. you know, or, or vice versa, you know. You could perceive 30 minutes there, come back. <laughs> You've had eight hours of sleep, and you're like, Jesus, this night really went by, didn't it? Shit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes. In fact, I've had that several times. And there's <laughs> other, other times you only sleep three or four hours, you feel like you slept eight or ten, and you're like, what? Mm-hmm. That's because you've experienced eight or ten when you were in your other focus, perceptually speaking. When you Dude. when you were focused into that different time space, wherever it is that dreams take place, wherever it is that consciousness goes to experience that, that's a totally different space time. Mm-hmm. I think of it like this. Okay, there's a space. Okay, let me just say this as the x-axis, and there's time. Okay, I think of it like this. Sorry. Space is the y-axis, time is the x-axis. So you find your point wherever you are in space, whatever location in the world, in the universe. Well, as time progresses, each time that dot moves, it's a new universe, you know? Yeah. It can't be the same. So, yeah, time, me, do, time doesn't progress because all time is is movement through space. Mm-hmm. It's I've used the DVD analogy, everything existing on the DVD, the whole movie at once. But you could also look at it as a film strip, like a movie theater. You've got a roll of film, and it's got frames. It all okay, so it, it all exists at once until you run it through the projector. Mm-hmm. Then, and the projector is consciousness. Well, uh, the the projector projects the reality to the screen that we call the movie, and mm-hmm. it seems to be moving forward in time. You see people doing things. You see stuff taking place. You know, Indiana Jones is in the Temple of Doom doing his thing, or whatever the case may be, mm-hmm. and. Uh, but you know that all that, every every single scene in that movie you watched, is all existing at once on that roll of film. It only appears to have forward movement through time 
because it's not time that's moving, it's the film that's moving. It's not time that's moving, it's the film. Okay. So, so it's not we, that... we are moving. Time isn't ticking. We are. So, like, with what I just said about the points on the axis between space and time, it's like, it's not that the axis itself is moving. It's that the consciousness that is following it senses some kind of movement. No, not senses. Creates. Creates? Yeah. Does the, does the, um... You know, when you load the film into the projector and roll it, is the film and the projector, are, are those things sensing movement that is happening that has nothing to do with them? That, oh my god, they're sensing this movement. Or are they causing the movement? Hmm. You get what I'm saying? Yes, I, then, I do. Then because there's more than one past, more than one present, more than one future, if you want to compare that to movies again, let's just say... Um, this movie, this reality, what we perceive to be uh, this universe, let's compare it to, um, you know, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, standard DVD version. Oh, but wait, but then there was the, VH, the VHS THX version, remastered. Oh, but then there was the original VHS version. Oh, but now wait, let's go back to the DVD version. There's the standard DVD version. There's the director's cut version. There's the the producer's version with extra added deleted scenes. And then, oh, now we're going to step it up again. Now we've got the, the main release Blu-ray version. And now we've got the Blu-ray uh, extended version. And now we've got the, the, the Blu-ray director's cut. And the Blu-ray extended version director's cut. And and the, the Blu-ray extended director's producers with deleted scenes and special bonus features. And, but they're all... The same movie, but different variations, mm -hmm. all existing in parallel. <laughs> Not to mention all the other movies that exist. Exactly. And all the other variations on all those movies. And, and they all exist at once. <laughs> all so. the movies on my hard drive, they're, they're existing at once. They're all on that drive. Mm -hmm. Yes. They exist at so once. So having this conversation right now, uh, so time is just movement through space? Yep. Let me put it, let me, let me do this. Remember we were talking about Doctor Who's TARDIS? Yes, I love that show. Okay. Well, Doctor Who, he's in his TARDIS traveling through time. So, you know, his his view, his personal view of time is subjective. What he did yesterday could have been the year 1683. What he's doing now could be the year 3340. What he's doing tomorrow could be the year 50,000 B.C. You know, whatever. His time mm -hmm. is subjective, right? Yes. Now, imagine this. Imagine you're taking the entire planet Earth, mm -hmm. metaphorically speaking, and you put it in something like a TARDIS. The TARDIS is traveling through time all over the place, just like Doctor Who. And so all 7 billion people are having that same shared, well, mostly shared, some shared, some not, probabilities and all that, but for the most part, the same shared collective reality, singular reality. Just like Doctor Who has his reality, because he's in the TARDIS, you know, zipping through space-time. But the people of the Earth don't know anything about space and time, and don't know that the Earth is in a TARDIS. Again, I'm speaking metaphorically. They don't know that the Earth is in a, a TARDIS, because a bunch of top, you know, 1% globalist assholes have lied to us and said, Oh, no, there's just one reality that we're in. There's no TARDIS, there's none of that, there's, oh, there's just this, and that's it. So you got 7 billion people having this extremely shared <laughs> experience. Yeah. It's like seven, seven billion people all simultaneously being Doctor Who in that TARDIS, so to speak. I mean, I'm not being too literal. Oh. I'm, being, I'm being metaphorical, but I'm making, making a point. So we think there's only one reality, one reality only because a bunch of megalomaniacal assholes have told us that, and we've been dumb enough to believe them. But that doesn't mean that everything outside the TARDIS doesn't exist and doesn't operate the way it operates. You know what I'm saying? Like, um, so as humanity's waking up, we're starting to realize these things. And it's like, oh, more than one version of Earth, more than one this, more than one that, parallels and probabilities and space-time and time-space and so on and so on. And if we're aware of that, then we can't be locked into a singular reality that they want to label as a new world order and have a police state, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera then we can't be locked into that. Everybody literally disperses out of that reality that they were trying to create, goes off into all the different parallels that they prefer, 
and their whole plan is fucked. Holy crap. Um, yes. You get what I'm saying? Yes. If they can't all lock us into one singular reality that they have absolute control over, then what could they possibly do to anybody? Nothing. And we're in the process of awakening to how things actually work. But of course, the idea of the way things actually work um, destroys a lot of sacred cows, hurts a lot of butts, you know. So it's not so easy as, hey, everybody, check this out. Here's the way it works. And everybody's like, oh, okay, cool. Thanks for the uh, thanks for the memo. Wow, we don't got to listen to these guys. Okay, cool. Fuck off, guys. <laughs> Going into our own realities. Bye. And then you have all the timeline splits and the globalists are just left there butthurt and crying. No. It's it's not that easy. Okay, let me ask you this: How would be able to how would we be able to move through time? Remember my example of the ascension. Of the what? The ascension and the blindfolds. Oh yeah. Here's a question: What makes you think that you're not already doing a lot of things that you're just oblivious to? You're in the room you want to be in. All the furniture's there. Everything's exactly what you need, what you want, where you'd prefer it to be, but. You know, pesky blindfolds making you think you're not there. You got these belief systems that are like, oh, where you want to be is on some other planet, in some other galaxy, in some other universe, in some other dimension, way, 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 way far away, impossible to get to, but definitely not where you already are, when really, <laughs> he's got a bunch of blindfolds. Someone comes up and says, hey, well, you're already there, why don't you take up the blindfolds? Well, shut up, that's stupid. Nick's are going to try to tell me oh. Santa Claus is real, and I should, you know, listen to the tooth fairy and... And, you know, wish on a, a rabbit's foot, you know, whatever. Just, like, this whole, like, rolling your eyes. <laughs> yeah, right, you know. So trying to sell me a bridge and not in the market today. Thank you. Oh, yeah. It does seem like that sometimes. It's That's called the Cosmic Joke. That's it's the been, Cosmic Joke? It's been called the Cosmic Joke. Have you ever heard of the Cosmic Joke? I've heard of it, but not actually of it. Cosmic Joke is that everything you're looking for, everything you're wanting to be, Everything you're wanting to do, all of it, you already have it, you already are it, you just don't know. So you look in what appears to be the external to yourself, thinking, oh, what I want must be so far away, some arduous journey, and oh man, how am I ever going to... You know, so it's a cosmic joke. It's like we're playing hide-and-seek with ourselves, in a way. Mm -hmm. We okay. don't know that we already are where we're looking to be, because we've got all these blindfolds on, so... And, you know, in a way... The blindfold is literal, in a way, because something like 96% of the universe is made of dark matter and dark energy. We can't see it. Literally can't see it. It is yeah. there. It does exist, but we can't see it. So we literally cannot see, literally cannot see, conceive of, perceive of, 96% of our surrounding reality. So in a way, it literally is blindfold. Damn. Literally, in a, in a way. We're clearing it off, though, eventually. Dude, so wouldn't it be so cool if, like, reality for humans became similar to Star Wars? Like, I want to be alive then. No, not Star Wars. Star Wars is like a globalist, elitist... Star Trek, maybe? Yeah, that might be a bit closer. <laughs> Have you ever seen Doctor Who? Sorry, I haven't seen much of Star Wars. I just meant, like, all the aliens and the humans interacting. But... Or the knowledge that we already do interact and we already are all related and the term alien is like calling a black person an air. <laughs> you know, it's just song. Oh. You know what I mean? Yeah. Do you think that God is separate from our consciousness? Separate and one at the same time. Because you couldn't have the one idea without the other. Can you have light wow. without dark? Can you have light without dark? Can you have up without down, left without right, top without bottom? One side of the coin yeah. literally without the other? No, you can't. So, like, God is... What is it? it is Why does anything exist? Why does consciousness exist? What is it? Again, when you look at the whole idea of everything being at all at one point, you realize that those, those questions require reality to be linear and for there to be no multidimensionality, no multiple simultaneousness. The questions that are being asked in that, in that form require a beginning, a middle, and end. They can't be answered any other way, which is why they can't be answered. Well, it's like asking the marital status of the number five. Is it a bachelor? Is it married? We haven't figured it out yet. Okay, what? I'm just asking, do you see how those questions literally require linearity? 
they require being answered in okay. Here Not is the beginning here, and then... I think, okay. It's basically you're asking, when you ask why does consciousness exist, it's like asking how did it come to be. That's the moment. Oh, I didn't mean it like that. I just mean like, okay, what, what is existence of anything? And how can something just always be? How can New York and Chicago coexist? What the fuck? Just I just think about it like everything well, that when you're when you're not viewing time as a as a where and you're going back to it being a when, that's the conundrum, and that's what I mean by linearity. Linear time requires the past, the present, the future to be in sequence, and rejects the idea of multiple simultaneousness. Like, Why isn't there just nothing? No, so there is nothing. It's simply just not nothing. You can't have something without nothing, and you can't have nothing without something. Oh, fuck. Dude, why is there... What the hell? Like, I just don't understand. Well, here's the thing. Can you, when you say understand, you're trying to compute it, calculate it. Can you calculate a painting? No. It's observable data. When you draw your art, that's not an equation. It's not something calculable. It's something you observe and look at. And everybody views art from their own perspective, right? You know the old saying, life is art? Yeah. Take it literally and apply it to the questions you're asking. If you're asking questions that require calculation, linear calculation, you already know art can't be calculated. You can't calculate a painting. You look at a painting. You can't calculate music. You listen to music. It's not a fucking math problem. Music is heard. Paintings are seen, so on and so forth. And if you try to calculate them as if they are math equations, as if they are not things to be seen and not things to be heard, aren't you going to be indefinitely confused as to the nature of paintings and music? Like, irresolvably, yeah, okay. indefinitely confused within it's that box. It's confusing to me. I feel like, how can just consciousness just exist? There has to be something that puts it there. And I that's, mean, that's requiring linear time. I know, but how can there not be linear time? Like, I get, okay, as far as... I'm not, Earth, sa I'm not, the saying, there, I'm not saying there isn't linear time. I'm saying everything isn't exclusively linear time. Just like all, all t-shirts are not exclusively white t-shirts in size medium only. I get it, but just because there's not linear time and just because all time and space are existing at one point, what I'm is not, putting I'm not, that there? I'm not saying there's... How can that not, always exist? I'm not saying that there's not linear time. I'm saying that the totality of everything isn't trapped in linear time, this past, present, future thing. I'm not saying okay. linear time doesn't time and exist. Space existing of at course one point. it exists. We wouldn't be experiencing it if it didn't exist. Okay, time and space existing at one point. How did that get there? Again, that's a linear question. It's requiring all time to be linear for there to be no multiple simultaneous existence, and requiring a point in time in which there is nothing, then requiring a point in time that some way, somehow, something, or someone, or some such, created from the nothing, something, somehow. But how can there always be something? How can Chicago coexist with New York? <laughs> it just why, doesn't... I'm saying, why, why, did, why didn't New York have to be born, live, and die... And then, you know, New York had a kid called Chicago, which was born, lived, and died, and, you know, the grandkids Phoenix, Arizona, and then the great grandkids San Diego. Why, why, why didn't that do that? Why, why can they coexist on the same continent? Why? You don't realize that that's literally the question. I don't see how that is what I'm asking. Because time is a form, when is a type of where? A city is a where. If something is a where, a place, a location, locations can coexist with other locations, can't they? I thought I was talking about time and space as a whole. Look, time is a type of location. Remember we said, when is a type of where? A location, like a city, it's a place. I've gone through every possible analogy to simplify this, like like all kinds of analogies. I've been through DVDs, film strips, all kinds of stuff. Continents, cities. The problem here is your mind is saying, no, Dave, when cannot be a type of where linear time has to be the basis for everything. And any other answer, I'm just not going to make sense of. It's literally a paradigm rejection. 
You know what I'm saying? Like, like a fundamentalist Christian saying, like, you know, this fundamental, like, similarly, like, you know, this fundamentalist Christians that are all hateful and preaching fire and brimstone, but they genuinely think they're being loving and doing the Lord's work. Try telling them how they're not. Try telling them how, how that's not what the hell Jesus is talking about. Is that, are, are any attempts in that going to get through for as long as they're choosing to hold that perspective? No, of course not, because they're insisting, no, 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 you're wrong. You're just, you're Okay, so, what, what is eternal? What is what? What is eternal? To the best of my understanding, eternal and infinite are two slightly different things. Eternal means linear time can go on in two directions indefinitely back and forth. Infinite is the whole everything existing at once thing, to the best of my knowledge. Okay. If space is just what consciousness has... Okay. May I make a What's suggestion? What's the difference between space and matter? May I make a suggestion? Yeah. May I suggest that it's entirely possible <clears throat> that you might inadvertently be overcomplicating something that is actually a little more simplistic because of a belief system that says this has to be complicated? You know, kind of like my mom and computers. Like, you know, you already know, especially being a, a younger person, there's, you know, there's a lot of things that are very, very simple on computers. You know, point and click. Oh, look, there's the link. I can click that. It goes to the site. But you know how a lot of, like, I'm sure you've noticed a lot of older people have great difficulty with that. And no matter how many times you explain, look, just click there. It's right there. Just click. It does it for you. They seem to just, like, not get it. They're like, I don't get it. It's so hard. And you're like, no, it's not. Just look, just click there. You can see it, right? You see that? Yeah, well, just, just click. Left click. Here's the mouse. Click there. Boom. And, but you know how, like, they, they still manage to somehow not get it? Like, have you had that experience with older people? Um, maybe a couple times. Yeah. Well, that's because they have a belief system they're not willing to let go of. And that belief system is computers have to be hard because they're machines and because they're electronic and there's no other reality. So the idea of, oh, look, this on a computer on a machine can be easy. You know how that sounds to them? That sounds to them like you're saying, well, here, it's simple. All you have to do is climb the magic ladder up to the mystical rainbow, take the cloud over to the unicorn of bliss, and then the unicorn of bliss will tell you how to pursue the candy cane of wisdom. It sounds like a bunch of shit. You know what I mean? Because it's in direct defiance of a belief system that says reality, this aspect of reality absolutely is this, can only be this, nothing but this, period, finito. And it's so ingrained. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So you have a belief system that says no way, no how, and any reality can when be a type of where. No. And so notice that older people with computers, when they, when they don't understand the simple answer, and they're insisting that there must be a, com a more complex crazy complex answer that fits their paradigm like like they're wanting you to give them this complex list of step-by-step -step instructions of some complex thing that they could have on paper to reference to and okay go to this step and that step they want this complex list so have you ever noticed that what they do when they're not satisfied with a really simple answer they rephrase the question to like try to trick you into giving them the overly complex answer that they're looking for but no matter how many times they try to rephrase it, it doesn't change the fact that the answer to their question is actually simple. And you're just, you're just talking to them like, look, you know, no matter how much you try to rephrase that, I don't have an overcomplicated answer for you. The answer is real simple. It's the only one I have. And they're just refusing to accept it. They keep rephrasing the question, trying to, to milk an overly complex answer out of you. They're thinking, oh, Kristen has to have this overly complex 10-step thing that I can listen to her say and I can write it down and I can have this piece of paper here with me. And whenever I want to do this thing on this complex, overly complicated, confounded contraption that I don't understand, I can just pull out this piece of paper and this piece of paper will guide me because it's got 10 steps explained right here. That's what they're looking for. They accept no other reality. Anything else sounds like unicorns and fairy dust. You know what I'm talking about. You've experienced this with older people, haven't you? Okay, what's the difference between space and matter? Everything is energy, including space. Even the void? Yes, everything is energy. Every is consciousness energy? Obviously. If everything is energy and consciousness is a part of energy, then one would imagine. Okay, what is the absence?
absence of energy? Non-existence. And Why isn't there an absence of energy? Because everything that exists is made of the stuff. And we are unable to perceive non-existence because we exist. I mean, try to think, try to imagine what it would be like to not exist. Like, literally, try to exist. Oh, I have. Non-existence. I have so many and, times. And you can't. It's impossible. Because no matter wherever you go, there you are. You can't help but exist while you're trying to imagine non-existence. I've just tried to imagine what it would be like if everything, time and space, just if it wasn't. But non-existence means no awareness of time and space, no awareness of existence. Oh, I know. So I was just that, thinking that, that, yeah. this black void, but would it even be a black void? Because a black void is something. Exactly. So what would it be? I'm giving you the simple answer, and as per my previous analogy, it's bouncing. It is not possible for that which exists to perceive non-existence. Not possible. Anywhere, any when, any how, any way. Because if you're trying... It's a paradox. If you're trying to perceive non-existence, the problem is that you exist while you're trying to perceive non-existence. Yes, I think, therefore I am. Yeah, and you can't help that. You can't change that. So no matter what, you cannot perceive non-existence by default of the fact that you exist. You are existing while you are trying to perceive non-existence. You cannot make an attempt to perceive non-existence unless you exist. And if you exist, then there's no way in hell you can perceive non-existence, because there's, there's, there's no way you can know what it's like to not exist. It would be so interesting if nothing existed. I, what is nothing, you know? What the fuck? It's weird. Mm -hmm. it, Could God perceive of it? Is there any difference between us and God? It's, um, is, is again, God again, again, fr again, fractal patterns, multiple simultaneous. It, it's like, it, it's kind of like, the problem with these sorts of things is when we talk about them as if we're trying to take 100 gallons and fit it into a one-gallon bucket, no matter how you talk about it, it doesn't work as long as you're doing that. <laughs> you know what I mean? A little bit. So when you try to do that, that's where the paradox comes in. Because it's obviously you're not going to fit 100 gallons into a one-gallon bucket. No way, no where, no how, no whatever. So obviously it creates paradox. So uh, does consciousness create space? and time, or does it just create its experience through them? I know it configures matter to appear a certain way. If time is movement through space, and everything is made of consciousness, well, then it's all the same stuff. Wait, everything is made of consciousness? Well, consciousness is energy, and everything is energy, yeah. There's different levels um, of consciousness. That's weird. There's different levels of consciousness, of course. I mean, your table's not going to start fucking talking to you. No. <laughs> not all consciousness. But how is it aware of shit? It doesn't know shit. Exactly. Well, if you let me finish, I was saying <laughs> conscious, uh, consciousness doesn't require self-awareness. There's a difference between... It doesn't? There's a difference between consciousness and self-awareness. Even within living things, like an amoeba is conscious, it's alive, it's a living thing, but is it self-aware? I highly doubt it. What kind of animals do you think are self-aware? Obviously humans, dogs and cats, girls, monkeys, dolphins. Like, I would say birds yeah, self-aware? I, I would say anything with an advanced enough central nervous system to be able to perceive that it is a separate entity from its surrounding environment. Okay. That it is moving through its environment, whereas I don't think an amoeba is it would be advanced enough to right. be able to perceive itself as being separate from anything else around it. Mm-hmm. I agree, yeah. That's my opinion, of course. Well, you're probably right. I mean, okay, so these inanimate objects and shit, they're not self-aware, but they are to some small, small level conscious. Think about it. Think of inanimate objects as like this. Um, obviously, you're sitting there aware of yourself, right? Mm-hmm. Your fingers are a part of you. They're not separate beings with their own brains and central nervous systems that are aware of themselves. But they're, they're a part of you. They're your fingers, right? Oh, yes. In that sense, they're just like the table and the chair. Wow. You see them outside of you. You can put your hands in front of your face and see them. And you know that your hands aren't looking back at you going, who the fuck are you? They're just your hands. 
-hmm. So your external environment, holographic external that is a part of your little section of space-time that consists of phones and chairs and whatever, it's a part of you, but it's not a self-aware part of you. It's not a directly attached part of you. It's just you are more than just your body. You're, you're expanded. And mm -hmm. just like you are more than just your brain, you've got your body, you know? So your tables and chairs and stuff around you aren't going to be like, hey, Kristen, what the fuck are you doing? Any more than you're going to put your hand in front of your face and your fingers are going to say, hey, what the fuck? What is this? Wow. You know what I mean? Yeah. And your fingers are alive, aren't they? I mean, if, if they weren't, you'd be in a lot of trouble. Yes. And my fingers are conscious. <laughs> But they are not self-aware. No, they aren't. Okay. But the tables and chairs and everything around you are made of energy, which is consciousness, but they're not self-aware. Yes. I'm pretty damn sure that they are not self-aware. So we are the universe experiencing itself. Subjectively, just like Bill Hicks said, yes. Now, I'm not saying that tables and chairs and stuff don't have awareness. As a matter of fact, um, diamonds are a type of rock, right? Mm-hmm. Diamonds can be used as hard drives. Most people don't know this. Um, there's, a, there's actually so much diamond out there that if they flooded the market, it would be completely worthless as a, as a jewelry gem. There's so much. Plus, they can lab create the shit now, too. It's another thing they don't want the masses to know. The information is out there. It, it's, wow. It, it's not like the information is being sequestered in some hole, but they just don't put it on the news and in the educational systems and say, attention everyone, guess what? You know, <laughs> Come here diamonds, create your own diamonds. Diamonds are really efficient for storing data. In fact, very, very large corporate systems, like way advanced anything you or I could imagine, really, but, you know, wow. mega, mega huge corporate systems. They, I don't know, look at what we're thinking of right now. I think listen, we could... They use diamond hard drives. And they lab create them. Now, they store the data on the diamond by laser, which is a light beam, right? Mm -hmm. Similarly to the laser in that diamond, tables, chairs, rocks, anything inanimate are storing the data of not only the nature of itself, but the nature of everything directly around it. It's acting as a hard drive. It doesn't mean it's self-aware. Your hard drive stores lots of data on your computer. It doesn't mean it's self-aware. It's not just going to start fucking talking. You look at the Hale 9000 or something. Unless you program it to. But, you know, you've got light all around you. Even in the dark, there's light. Frequency of light. So that's passing through everything. Information's flying back and forth. Being stored, transferred, moved around. It's all automatically. Wow. So inanimate our objects are like hard drives in that sense. Just because we haven't figured out how to tap that data yet, doesn't mean it's not there. A caveman ain't going to know how to access a hard drive. Doesn't mean the data ain't there. This is so cool to talk about. Because So you get what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah, I do. And you know what? It's a little bit corny, but see, this is, we're talking about ourselves mm -hmm. when we talk about the universe like this. Mm -hmm. This is us. Mm -hmm. That's just so cool. And it's, it's just like the, that feeling runs so deep in, into my core. I have a question. Very... I have a question for you. Oh, that's a little turn of the tables. <laughs> yeah. Well, when I'm going to relate it back to a previous question of yours. All right. Obviously, when you use a computer and you're doing whatever on it, DeviantArt, Facebook, TSU, Skype, whatever. Mm -hmm. There's an there's an interface that you use, right? And it seems to have a structure. In fact, when you go on web or browse multimedia, it, it looks like there's stuff there, right? Like yes. there's like there's physical things almost, like flowers and people and, and all this multimedia data. And when you're flipping, yeah, and when you're flipping through your browser tabs, you know, you're I mean you're clicking on stuff, right? It it seems like you're making an actual movement from one tab to another, um, and activating a command and Right click and up comes this box and there's all these other options. I mean, you know, you get me so far, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. You deem all of those things to be really there, right? I mean, you know your web browser exists, right? You use it. 
You know the tabs in the web browser exist. I mean, you use it. I'm pretty sure you're not sitting there scratching your head like, how am I using something that doesn't exist? I mean, you know it exists. You got your web browser, it has tabs, you got your desktop, you know, you got your little programs menu, you can search program, like, all that's there and it exists and you use it on a day-to-day basis, right? Yeah, oh yeah. But how can it exist? It's not physical. How can you clip, click on, physically click on a tab that doesn't exist? Because there is no tab. It's just, it's a holographic construct on the screen. There's no tab. It, your browser isn't being put into a file cabinet somewhere. When you close it, it's not in a, in a box in your closet. All those, those, just energy. those plants and birds on your screen and whatever, uh, those are just pictures. And in fact, they're pictures of a, a frame in time that isn't concurrent with our current time frame. It's the past. How yeah. are we watching the past if it's gone? How are we watching it? It seems to be there, but it's not. It seems physically there, but it's not. How are we watching the past, Kristen? These these MP3s and videos, we're listening to music that was recorded in the past. How the hell are we doing that? We're watching video of the past, and this video seems to be physical. There's objects. And when you're looking at something like interactive, like a website, it's things you can click on and move and do things with. But how can you click on them and move them and do things with them if they don't technically exist and they're not physical? It's you energy, might, Dave. Yeah, and it's you might, all energy. Oh, yeah. And you might try to explain to me, well, it doesn't need to be physical. It's just a light construct and it's data interacting with itself. It, it doesn't need to be physical because... You know, it doesn't matter that if, if how far back in the past music was recorded. That past moment always exists now in that file. You can o- open it up in an MP3 player, boom, no problem. That video, that movie, it could have been made in the 1930s, but you can load it up and, and there it is now. It's Even though it's gone, you can still interact with it because it's here it's now in this in this video file, and you, you can do that. But that's the very same question you have about time. Dave, how can time be a, be a place, a location? How, uh-huh. can, how can any place on the Internet be a location? How is Facebook a fucking location? Tell me this. It's not made of bricks. There's no roof over it. There's no people in it physically. How can, how can a web address be a location? How can a location on your hard drive be a location when all those files and folders don't physically exist? You know, how can you have things and locations and points in time pulled in from other times and these magical recordings, quote unquote, MP3s, video? It doesn't make sense, Kristen. And then you're like, <laughs> yes, it does, because it's all just computer files and a graphical user interface big deal it's all it's all right here it's all now it's all usable but Kristen that doesn't make sense and it's the exact same question how is what how is when a type of where Dave it doesn't make sense doesn't make sense how can time be a location doesn't make sense how can a web address be a location how can I be watching something from the 1930s on a screen, on a box, and it seems to physically exist inside there? But there is no inside there. There's this flat screen mm-hmm. playing. It's the same idea. And if I, if, if I insisted on keeping on that line of thought, no, no, there must be another explanation. These things have to exist somehow. Maybe, maybe we're accessing some other physical dimension, but there's some sort of a shield keeping me from directly touching it. Or if I went into all this craziness, it would just sound silly. Because then the answer that I would be rejecting is simply that a computer, the computer is the thing, and that there are types of things that are not physical, but you can still interact with them. There are types of wares that are whens, and you could still interact with them. Get what I'm saying? Yeah. But all of your questions were trying to say, no, 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 Dave. When, when can't be a type of where? Facebook.com can't be a location. Not possible. Give me an answer that fits in my box, Dave. The answer never does. Exactly. Otherwise, you wouldn't be asking the question. Exactly. Damn it. So you see what I'm saying? (laughs) Yeah. So it's not that the answers aren't available. It's not that the answers are incomprehensible. It doesn't require a brain the size of the universe to get it. It just requires removing the blindfold. 
this belief system that says, Dave, there's no way in fucking hell that I'm willing to accept that the answer is that simple, that the answer is that easy, because I firmly believe in difficulty, I accept no other reality, just like these old grannies who want the 10-step answer from me, when really the answer they don't want to face is, click here and you're done. Well, I'm accepting it for now. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So now, if you are accepting it for now, see how all of your previous questions suddenly get answered? It's like they negate themselves. So it's like, if all time and space can exist at one point, then it's, that basically it's the same thing time like, like cities. If you understand that when is a type of where, then it is no more or less difficult than understanding that Chicago and New York can coexist on the same continent. Literally the same idea. Literally not any more complicated than that, unless you have a belief system that says it has to be. So, can you explain to me how this can mean that everything always existed? <laughs> if when is a type of where, then every when has to coexist alongside every other when, because it's a type of where. Oh. Get what I'm saying? Yes. If you come to Chicago and then leave again, did Chicago fall out of existence simply just because you left? <laughs> or, did, or did you just change your focus? Did you change your okay. focus of consciousness back to uh, Covington? Chicago didn't die, cease to exist, whatever. You just shifted your focus from one where to a different where. And you shifted your focus by taking the bus or the metro or, or whatever in this hypothetical analogy, you know? Hmm. And that's how you did it. Just like, you know, you can shift your focus to locations online by just typing a different web address. Boop, new location. All right. Um, Does that make sense? Yes. And obviously, seeing as all space and time is existing at once, so technically we are kind of like Doctor Who and we don't even know it. It's like we're in the TARDIS and we don't know how to drive the damn thing. So we're all just kind of, Earth is in this TARDIS and we're just flying through and nobody knows how to drive the motherfucker that we're even in it. But well, you that, know what? that, that doesn't mean that, to learn. Yeah, but that doesn't mean that it's not drivable and that doesn't mean that we're not in it, metaphorically speaking. You know, I always did say if I could have the ability, it would be the ability to travel through time and space and be immortal for all intents and purposes. So. And wouldn't it be interesting to take off the blindfolds and realize that you've had it the whole time? It's just the blindfold kept you from seeing it. And just like a car, if you can't, if you can't see, you can't drive. Yeah. You know, you're in the passenger seat. <laughs> you're kind of at the mercy of somebody or something else. And you're hoping, you to, really God that they, you're hoping to God that they know what they're doing. And then you look up and see who's driving, and it's Bill, it's um, President Barack Obama and his wife, husband, Michael Michelle Obama. And you're like, oh, God help me. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of where we're at. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm really tired, so I'm going to go ahead and get off of here. But great talk, dude. And I'm also going to get out some books on the subject. Cool. Yeah. Or you could listen to audio books on the subject or read PDF books on the subject. All kinds of books. That too. Although they aren't physical books. But they still have the same thing in them. <laughs> I, know, I was joking about earlier. Hey, that's another thing. When you read a book and the knowledge goes from the book to your head, how to get there. That's another Mad. another one of those type of questions, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> Alright. Good night, dude. Sometimes the most simple and correct answer is simply that it is what it is. <laughs> yeah. Click the link! It is what it is. No, it's going to be more complicated. Click it. That's it. It is what it is. No, there's going to be ten complicated steps. No, there doesn't. Click the fucking link. <laughs> it's kind of like the spiral of me sitting there trying to think of what non-existence would be when it's not possible. Well, hey, just to let you know, one of the big things that gets in the way of understanding is we have a block on one of the most important understandings of all, that it's okay if something can't be known. When you come to that realization, there's a ton of shit that you didn't know that suddenly becomes a lot easier to see because that blocks out of your way. Wow. The idea that it is okay if something cannot ever be known, no matter how many realities you might experience, incarnations, whatever, that there's just some things that you can't ever know. Really? And once you're okay with that idea, then it opens the door to knowing all sorts of stuff that not being okay with that one little idea was totally cock-blocking. 
Okay, yeah, and I see what you're saying, but are there really some things that we can't know? And if so, why? I don't know. Like, I, whether, I, I don't know wrong. whether there are or not. But I will. Oh. I will tell you this: having ideas or constructs, they're thought forms in and of themselves. So to so to say, I'm not okay with the idea of there be there being some things that I cannot ever know. That sentence is a construct. It's a thing. It's not a physical thing. It's mm -hmm. like a computer, but it's a thing. And when you hold judgment against it, say, no, you're not allowed to exist. You can't be there. My ego doesn't like it. It creates a negative feedback loop. What you resist persists. And we already know that when you put that kind of resist on, resistance on something and you spiral in these negative feedback loops, it cock blocks data like a motherfucker. Okay. We've had entire conversations on data blocking and cock blocking and, and, you know, all this other stuff. One tiny little thing, just like one tiny little piece of knowledge like the world is round, can completely revolutionize the world. We wouldn't even have been inspired to invent airplanes or satellites or any, uh, any of all that without knowing a tiny little simple fact that we take for granted that we're living on this ball. Um, so one wow. little bitty piece of knowledge can revolutionize the planet in like exponentially profound ways. And the absence of one tiny little bitty piece of knowledge can completely send a civilization in the opposite direction. Because before that, you know, we're all just running around on, you know, horse and buggy and in ships and terrified of falling off the edge of the flat earth like a bunch of freaking idiots. So we can see how... The inclusion or exclusion of a tiny little bitty itsy teensy crumb of knowledge literally changes the world in exponentially profound, very physical ways. <coughs> Super see interesting. What, see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So if you judge the idea, well, it's not okay that there's some things out there that I might not be able to ever know, that creates a cock block of the ginormous proportions that I just spoke of. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Because whether yeah. whether we can know absolutely everything or whether there's things we can't know, that's irrelevant. But if you're creating oscillation on the idea of, you know, something's not being able to know to be known, not saying that that's an absolute fact, but just the idea of it becomes a thought form. So just like a computer file, it is, it exists. So you can resist it, you can judge it, you can wage war against it, which creates this cock block of epic fucking. Yeah, luckily I uh, don't really care about not knowing everything. I mean, I just want to know as much as I can. Yeah, but I mean, my point was simply that the tiniest little crumb of knowledge that we take for granted that might seem so insignificant has such amazingly profound, massive implications. Mm -hmm. And we, we forget that. We don't realize that, you know. So you see how a little tiny bitty bitty teensy crumb missing is a massive ginormous blindfold and a tiny little bitty teensy teeny crumb inserted is like wham major change major clarity explosion of knowledge explosion of I do see that, and it's the same thing with an individual human consciousness. So keep that in mind next time you're really feeling sorry for yourself. <laughs> Get what I'm saying? Yeah. Have a good night. Yeah, um, I have volleyball tomorrow and I'm pretty nervous, but I'm just gonna chill And if it's time. okay to be nervous, just like it's okay that there might be some things you might not ever, ever, ever know regardless, then all of a sudden, the cock block is gone. William Black <laughs> cannot have a dialogue, and your nervousness cannot control you. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Now, don't Amen. You, don't you feel better? A lot better, yeah. And notice that it's not a lack of nervousness. You're simply feeling better about your nervousness. The cock yes, block is gone. It's more irrelevant. It's easier to walk now because there isn't a big six foot wide, six inch thick penis in your ass. <laughs> so it's easier to walk. You're still nervous. It's just easier to walk. Six foot wide. So there's not so much stress, you know. <laughs> yeah. You see what I'm saying? Wide. So there, there you go. So hopefully that helps. Whether it's ha nervous hanging out with friends, nervous doing anything. Mm -hmm. Just know that it's okay to be nervous and most of the edge will go off. and be like, oh man, what a relief. Yeah, I'm still really nervous. But my God, all that oscillation and amplification of suffering is gone. Oh yeah. You know? 
maybe my brain won't feel like it's melting inside of my yeah, skull. Exactly. So it's <laughs> not going to get rid of the nervousness, only ex- uh, only following through and experiencing, okay, this reality is okay, it's cool, I can deal with this. That'll get rid of the nervousness. But in the meantime, it's all about just being okay with the nervousness. If you're okay with it, like, okay, it's okay that I'm nervous. It's completely understandable. I don't got to oscillate this and escalate it to such neurotic proportions that I feel paralyzed. It's perfectly natural and understandable that I'd be a little nervous. That's okay. Even if I'm a lot nervous, that's okay. The suffering factor is gone because I'm not holding it against myself. And as far as sometimes being a bit confused about time and space, well, yeah, that's okay. Nervousness, confusion, all that stuff. <clears throat> be <clears throat> be okay with it. <laughs> that doesn't mean want it. That doesn't mean agree with it. That, none of that. Mm-hmm. It just means be at peace. And remember our conversation yeah. about peace earlier. It's not about everything. Don't fuck with it. it. Well, it's not about getting along and everybody agreeing and dancing around the campfire. No, that's not peace. That's Nazism, actually. Uh, <laughs> peace is, yeah. like you said, don't fuck with your neighbor, as you would not want them to fuck it with you. So, don't fuck it with yourself. Yeah. You know? Or your own emotions. Fucking, you're, you're just, you're waging an internal war. You're fucking with that proverbial neighbor inside your mind, so to speak. You're fucking with an aspect of yourself, and it's creating conflict. So, peace is an end to conflict. Peace isn't having all the answers. Peace isn't getting along with everybody. Peace isn't everybody agreeing. It's, it's simply an end to Wow. Well, on that note, um, you have yeah. a great night. <laughs> yeah, dude. I'm pretty tired, but I'm, I have a feeling I'm going to sleep pretty good. Most likely. I would imagine so. Talk to you later, dude. Love you. Love you, too. Appreciate you. Thank you for the awesome conversation. Thanks.